Amen. Amen. Turn in your Bibles with me to the book of Genesis. We're going to the beginning this morning. Genesis chapter 3. No, excuse me, Genesis chapter 6. While you're getting there, a um, couple of little things of how we're going to look at Scripture today. Uh, I, I, I'm taking a card from uh, uh, the pastor at, at church camp this, this week, uh, kind of taking some of his point. And, and I thought it was interesting because most of the time we as pastors like to zoom in on Scripture. Uh, that's kind of how we, we take up, we, we pick up a section, and we kind of zoom in on a point. And that's fine. Y'all know what, what I mean? Like there's, there's lenses for a camera, and some of them are like telephoto lenses, right? You see the ones that they got at the Saints game where they're like the, the lens is on a stand? I'd love to have one of those. They can like see a deer from 4,000 yards. Uh, and you see this big lens, and, and they are. They're, they're made for reaching way out there. Uh, but there's another lens called a, uh, called a wide-angle lens. A wide-angle lens is usually what we're trying to do when we're getting a picture of a group of people. You want to try and back, you want to get as much of it as you can, or a landscape where you're trying to see as pretty, as much of the picture as possible. You need a big picture of the story. Well, that's kind of what we're going to look at here is realizing that, yes, most of the time we like to dig in and get a point, but I'm going to take kind of a, a big picture look at the story of Genesis. Um, what the first point I want to make out is that did you know the G book of Genesis covers a whole lot of time? Well, let's see how many Bible scholars we got in the room. How many of you think you could guess how far it is from Genesis chapter 1 in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth, to Genesis chapter, I believe that's 6, where God brings the flood. All right, so from Adam to Noah. You might want to take a rough guess on that. About a thousand years. A good guess? Double it. It's actually roughly 2,300, 2,400, or two, over 2,000 years. All right, so over 2,000 years. Now that's giving that I am a, a, a six-day creationist. Okay, so if you're a person that thinks the six-day creation took a lot longer than that, you need to add some, okay? So however much you think it took more than six days, add that on top of 2,000, and you'll have a rough estimate of what happened time-wise. Y'all, there's a whole lot of stuff can happen in 2,000 years. That's basically how far back from us to Jesus. A whole lot can happen in 2,000 years. Uh, so that's kind of the spectrum we're going to be looking at, at just a piece here. So turn with me to the book of Genesis chapter 6, and you realize that there was Adam and Eve, and then they were populating the earth. Uh, they did a good job of it from what I hear. Uh, they, they were populating the earth, and they lived a long time so they could have a lot of kids, and apparently they had a lot of kids, and as they populated, the kids were misbehaving. All right, that... Got to get an amen on that one. The kids were misbehaving. Uh, it got really bad, and that's where we pick up here in, in Genesis chapter 6, starting in verse 5. Then the Lord saw the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intention of the thoughts of his heart was only evil continually. That's wordy. They was being bad. And the Lord regretted that he had made man on earth, and it grieved him to his heart. So the Lord said, I will blot out man whom I have created from the face of the land, man and the animals and the creeping things and the birds in the heavens, for I am sorry that I have ever made him. But, aren't y'all happy when there's buts in the Bible? <laughs> but, Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Noah found favor in the eyes of the Lord. Folks, this is part of the story. And what we like to tell this, isn't this something that you like to teach the little kids? Noah and the boat, right? You got Noah's ark, and we like to paint it on the walls. You ever think about when you painted it on the walls that it stunk a lot more than uh, it looked like? I mean, you really wouldn't want kids walking around in an ark. That was, some, that was probably a pretty rough place to be. I doubt that they stopped needing dung beetles during that time. You think there was a dung beetle on that boat? <laughs> he was a happy fella because there wasn't many to compete with and I bet there was plenty to go around. So we have this, we have this situation where man was dealing and reeling with sin. Anybody ever been dealing with sin in your life? Anybody been reeling in it? 
Oh, you know what I'm talking about. You want to get out of it. You're ready to get out of it. You've already confessed it. You're already put that aside. And at the same time, there's the consequences of sin. And the biggest consequence of sin is you still like it. And so we're dealing and reeling with sin. And that's what's going on. And God looks down and He says, it's covered in sin. Man is blanketed in sin. Man is completely accepting of their sin. They've gone and taken it on and owned it. It's part of their identity. They, they are living in it. And God says, I am so upset with this that I, I would rather not have them than to have this. But He looked at Noah and He found favor. Noah was not a perfect man. Read the whole story. Noah wasn't perfect. We're glad that he was good. But let me tell you something. Noah wasn't even just good enough. God did not find favor in Noah because Noah was good enough. God found favor in Noah because he looked down in Noah's life and he saw his image. I'm not perfect. I ain't even close. Neither are you. And yet God looked at you and found favor. You're his favorite. Any of y'all ever lied to your kids and told them they were your favorite? I hope that if you told them your favorite that they were your favorite that you were lying. Okay? Unless they're the only kid you got. That, 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 that's a rough one. But it, God looks at you and you're his favorite. He finds favor in you. He adores you. He loves you. He knows everything about you. Even the stuff we don't. And he still loves you. That's a big part of the story. Ephesians chapter 2 Verse 7 and through 9 says this. For by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from your own doing. It is the gift of God, not a result of work, so that no man can boast. Noah can't even boast. And he found enough gopher wood to build a really big boat. <laughs> I don't even know what gopher wood is. That's what you, yeah, well, try going for some wood right now. That boat would have been an expensive boat today. Uh, I'm just saying that Noah was, had found, God had found favor in Noah just simply because of that same thing. Out of the grace of his gift, he saved you. Out of the grace and favor in Noah, he saved Noah and his family. And he saved the creation that's so beautiful. Folks, I saw some pretty stuff this week. I mean some pretty stuff. I don't even know what some of those animals were called. I don't know why, but it's right there in that part of Texas is, is covered in, in game ranches. Man, they, you, you can go hunt a giraffe if you want to. I didn't see a giraffe. I was looking for them. But I saw all, I mean, man, things almost the size of a cow got horns to do this. And they're just majestic. And when God looked at him, he said, this is very good. And he saved him. Just like Noah, you're a sinner. Just like Noah, you have been found in favor. That's grace. Genesis chapter 12. Flip to Genesis chapter 12. We're going to turn stories over. Like I said, big picture stories, so we're going to move on through. All right, we're already into 12 chapters. This one is about Abraham. Anybody know the story of Abraham? It's more than a few chapters long. Okay, we've got a good bit about Abraham here. Father Abraham had many sons. I always thought that was a, a weird one because he really didn't have many sons. Now, uh, Jacob, now he, Jacob had many sons. He had a load of them. Uh, father Abraham says he had many sons, meaning he was going to be the father of many nations. Here we have the promise uh, to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, and I'm using Abram because his name wasn't Abraham yet, 
is the Lord said to Abram, Go from your country and your kindred and your father's house to the land that I will show you. And I will make you a great nation and I will bless you and I will make your name great so that you will be a blessing. So that I will bless those who bless you and for him who dishonors you I will curse. And in you all the families of the earth will be blessed. That's a pretty big promise. It's a pretty big promise. Y'all, Abraham was probably a decent fella. He wasn't perfect. We know that. I mean, the Lord corrected him more than once. He wasn't perfect. And Abraham actually pulls off some pretty sketchy stuff later in the Scripture. I'm not going to lie. It's like really kind of like, what were you thinking, sketchy stuff? Abraham wasn't a perfect guy. But for some reason, God looked down at Abraham and just chose him. He chose him. There were a lot of people that could have been chosen. There were other names on that list. We talk about the descendants and, uh, of Noah and, and who was there. And then we have this, this man, man of Abraham. Now, was Abraham a righteous man? We're going to look at that. Yes, he was. Uh, but Abraham was chosen by God. And he came to him. God came to Abraham and he says, Look, I'm choosing you. I'm choosing you. I'm going to bless you. You don't have any kids right now, but I promise you, I'm going to bless you so much that your lineage is going to have not one, but multiple kingdoms. I mean, I don't know how many people got to be under you as a king to be a, a kingdom. But there was not one king. We're not talking about just Israel. We're talking about kingdoms that came from the lineage of Abraham. He says, I'm going to make you a father of nations. And he says, I'm going to make you a great nation. And he says, and on top of that, people that bless you, I'm going to bless. And people that curse you, I'm going to curse. In other words, I got your back. I'm going to put you where I want you to be. Now, what did Abraham have to do in order to earn that one? What was his side of the story? Anybody remember? Nothing. Those are all things that he did. He was obedient most of the time. He did trust God. He did have kids. But the truth of the matter is, is God asked nothing of Abraham in the beginning. He says, I'm going to do this. Now look, there was some stuff he asked Abraham to do. I'm not so sure that all of us would jump on, right? Circumcision at that point in your life is not something everybody wants to sign up for. He says, I'm going to make you different. But... The promise to Abraham was not dependent upon Abraham. It's what we call a one-sided covenant. Now, there are multiple covenants that happen in the uh, Old and New Testament. Uh, there are covenants that are made between man and God. There are covenants that are made between two people. Uh, my personal favorite is a blood covenant. I don't ever want to do this one. Anybody seen what that happens in a blood covenant? You take an animal and you cut it in half and you spread it out. I'm not making this up. This is like straight up Bible stuff here. You spread it out and you say, I promise I'm going to do this. And the other person says, I promise I'm going to do this. And then the two of you walk between the animal. That's nasty, isn't it? Really, when you find out what it really meant was, if I break my promise, you can do to me what we did to it. That's pretty bold. There are also if so wins covenants in scripture when God says if you do this I will do this if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and turn from their wicked ways then I will hear their prayers and I will heal their land there's an if then in there but when God looked at Abraham he says no I choose you and I'm going to bless the world through you Abraham called out for a purpose set aside from the rest of the population for the will of God. The even crazier thing that goes on is God telling Abraham, hey, I want you to run off, leave your family, leave everything, all your security. By the way, that was everything to them. Uh, this is what we call in the time of the patriarchs. Uh, the way that their, their world worked is they were kind of nomadic. Uh, they didn't necessarily stay. They stayed in a region, but they didn't necessarily stay in one place. And they were herdsmen, and they, they collected their stuff together. And dad, whoever the patriarch was, 
owned everything and everybody. <laughs> like it was your own little mobile kingdom here. And, and to say, I want you to leave your father's house means I want you to leave the security because there is no security if you don't have uh, uh, an army to take care of yourself. If you don't be able to band together uh, during attacks, then somebody can just come and take your stuff and you really can't do much about it. So Abraham says, yes, I will. I'll leave. I will leave all of my father's house. I'll leave all of my people. And I'm going to go where? To a land God tells me to. How many of y'all have ever had a struggle moving? You know you had to move and you moved? Anybody here has said, I'm going to move and I have no idea where? That would be fun, wouldn't it? Pack your stuff up. Get everything together. Hey, guys, we're leaving. Kids, pack up. Grab your favorites because you can't take it all. <laughs> where are we going, Dad? I don't know. When are you going to know? I don't know. When are we leaving? Tomorrow. What seems also more crazy than that God just picking this guy out of out of those there and said, hey, I'm going to choose him and I'm going to bless the world through him, is the fact that Abraham looks at him and says, okay. The faith of Abraham is astounding. I don't think there's any of us that compare anything we've ever had to do or not do that would even come close to comparing with what Abraham said yes to. In Romans chapter 4 it says this, For what does the scripture say? Abraham believed God. And it was counted to him as righteousness. Now to the one who works his wages are not counted as a gift, but what he is due. And to the one who does not work, but believes in him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted as righteousness. Abraham was called by God. And his faith was counted as righteousness. God found favor in Abraham. He was a sinner. And God found favor in Abraham. God found favor in Noah. Found favor in Abraham. And God called him. Folks, you are a sinner, you are favored by God, and you have been called by God. He chose you. I want you to remember back for just, just a brief moment. Remember back to choosing teams in grade school. Scariest thing that happens in all... I would rather have taken a, 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 a pop quiz and math then go out and choose teams. Why? Because I was the fat little kid. I didn't want to choose teams. And when the time happened every now and then that somebody says, man, I choose Mike, my heart leaps with joy. Still to this day, when God looks at me and says, son, I choose you. I want you on my team. It makes my heart leap with joy. For you have been found favor and you have been chosen. Genesis chapter 32, flip again. We got another part of the story here. We're going to skip a little bit. So we had Abraham. Abraham had some sons. One of his sons' name was Isaac. Isaac had a son. His he had multiple sons. And Isaac had a son named Jacob. And that is the story of where we're going to start off. I'll go ahead and give you a brief heads up. Remember, if you remember Jacob, Jacob had a big brother. His name was Esau. Esau was like the... He was the Bass Pro Shop version of humanity. You know what I mean? Like he was, he, he was straight up hunter, fisher. Like he was hairy and he knew it kind of thing, right? So you have Esau and then you have uh, Jacob. And Jacob... Um, Jacob was the kid brother, but just by a wee bit. I mean, like milliseconds. His twin brother went out and Jacob came out holding on to his heel because he just barely made it out. Uh, but it was a big deal because I told you this is a time of patriarchs and Jacob came out second. The firstborn son got the majority of everything and the responsibility of taking care of everybody. But in this weird turn of events, 
Jacob, uh, being a little bit of a deceiver, which is what his name means. Actually, it means one who supplants, which is a weird word. Uh, supplant means if I, through some type of trickery or uh, deception, I take your place. You know what I mean? Uh, so like you have a place in line in front of me uh, at the fish fry and, and I look at you and say, hey, look at that cat and I step in front of you. That would be supplanting myself. And that's what, that's what his name meant. And he was pretty good at it. Uh, he was a pretty manipulative kind of fella and, and he had kind of cheated his brother out of his birthright and he had cheated him out of, out of his blessing. And, and here we have the story of Jacob, the deceiver, the supplanter, and he's about to go back and actually have to face his brother and he's got to be a little bit scared. That's the story of we got Jacob here. So Jacob, the deceiver, the tricker, is going back and he's got to face the music. So on the way to face the music, he stops at a place called Jabbok. Uh, so that's where we pick up here, Genesis chapter 32, starting in verse 22. The same night he arose and he took his two wives and his two female servants and his eleven children and he crossed the ford of Jabbok. And he took them and sent them across the stream and everything else that he had. And Jacob was left alone. And a man wrestled with him until daybreak until the breaking of the day. And when the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket, and Jacob's hip was out of its joint as he wrestled with him. Then he said, Let me go, for the day is broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. All right, real quick, let me give you that. There's too many like pronouns in here. So you got Jacob. He's on the side of a river, and somehow he gets in a fight with a dude. Now, different translations are going to say man, God, and angel. Let's go with the fact that the person kind of identifies themselves as God, so we're going to go with God. Jacob physically wrestles with the manifestation physically with God. Some people would say he wrestled with Jesus. Any way you want to look at it, he was outmatched. Can I get an amen on that? He was outmatched, but he did pretty good. If you can wrestle all night long, I don't care when you started. <laughs> if you can wrestle all night long, you one bad man. If you can wrestle part of that night with your hip on a socket, you got a pain tolerance that is unreal. And I'll promise you, you would do good in any MMA fight in the, in the world. This guy had to have been really, really intent on winning that fight. And when he gets to the end, he says, I'm not going to let you go unless you bless me. What? Anybody ever looked at you and said, oh, God bless. God bless. I bless you. May his light shine upon you. I, I love that. I, I try to do it. I, I try to talk to my kids and say, look. I'm blessing you today. And I just speak a blessing on them. I pray a prayer of blessing on them. And, and it's important. It's good, right? You like it when people do that? But if I wrestled all night long with half a hip, I'm sorry. I'm looking for a little bit more. <laughs> you know? I was like, dude, I'm sorry. I want your shoes too. I mean, I don't know what... I want something. Come on, give me something. He says, I want you to bless me. And the man looks at him and he says, fine, your name is no longer deceiver. Your name is wrestles with God and man and prevails. Dude, that's a good name. That's a good name. I have a good name. I like my name. I'm not one of those guys that wish I'd had a different name. I like my name. My name is Michael Allen. Michael means mighty warrior. I like that. Allen means one who is like the Lord. I do not live up to my name all that well. But I like it. I don't think I would have liked having a name that meant supplanter, liar, tricker. Or to know that every time that I looked myself in the mirror that it was true. <coughs> How much of a blessing was it for God to speak on the father of Israel, the first to ever hold the name, so what his name is? Israel says, you're no longer Jacob, you are Israel. I mean, this is the actual guy that Israel is named after. <laughs> That's pretty, pretty big, right? How big of a blessing was it to him? 
2 Corinthians says this, From now on, therefore, we regard no one according to the flesh, even though we once regarded Christ according to the flesh. We regard Him thus no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, He is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. All this is from God and through Christ reconciled us to Himself and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. In other words... God gave you a new name, gave you a new identity. You were a sinner, you were a liar, you were a supplanter, you were a trickster. And God still found favor in you. Not only did He find favor in you, but He called you out. He set you aside for a purpose and said, this one's mine. And then He paid the price to make sure that you were bought in full. He paid completely for your salvation with His own blood. All to pull you aside and give you a total new identity in Him. He says, no longer do you have to see yourself as the fleshly person that you are. Instead, you get to look at yourself the way I look at you. Look at yourself through the blood that I have shed. And on the other side of it, what you see is a righteous person in the eyes of God. I've chosen you. I've set you aside. I have saved you. And now I've given you my identity. That's beautiful. Absolutely beautiful. Genesis chapter 50 one more. Told you, big picture. We've got to make some tracks here. Genesis chapter 50, starting in verse 15. Now this next person is going to go down from Jacob. We're going to get to Joseph. Everybody likes the story of Joseph. Anybody here really got a favorite part of Joseph's story? What's your favorite part? Because it's big. Somebody tell me your favorite part of Joseph's story. Really? When he reveals himself to his brothers, okay? I really like the whole uh, uh, coat of many colors thing. I just think for some reason I'm a visual person and I've always been trying to picture what did that coat look like. Uh, I like the idea. It kind of seems like a coat is, is kind of his downfall in the beginning. You know, he gets this coat and the coat's a problem. He gets put in Potiphar's house and he tries to uh, get away from uh, Potiphar's wife and, and she grabs a hold of his coat and he runs out. Y'all, I don't know if y'all got the picture of that, but that means that Joseph ran back to his room naked or pretty darn close to it. Uh, I don't know. That seems like a pretty funny story. There's not too many recorded uh, events of streaking in the Bible. Uh, I believe that's probably the first recorded uh, part, uh, uh, point of streaking. Uh, there's another one in the New Testament uh, in the book of Luke. Absolutely funny story where a kid has to run home naked. But it doesn't happen often, so it stands out to me. When we get right here, we're actually going to your spot. We're going to go to a point where Joseph, who had been uh, hated by his brothers, and for good reason, Joseph kind of ran his mouth when he shouldn't have, and, and he gets, um, I don't know, it, it looks like he's, they told the uh, dad that he's dead. They, they, they acted as if they killed him off, and they kind of shredded up the coat and put some goat blood on it and told dad, I'm sorry your son got killed by a wild animal. But what they really did is went and made a chunk of change off of him. They sold him off in slavery. Well, this crazy story of how Joseph goes along and he's ups and downs and bad points and low points. And I mean, he really has a rough life. He has a few high points in there, but it's really pretty rough. And Joseph, uh, all because he has been his position of being dethroned by his brothers and, and cast aside. And this time comes when all of a sudden Joseph is like vice president. It's not even vice president. He's like vice king over the largest country, most powerful country in all of the world, and he's the only, body, the only person that has food. I mean, that's really what it boils down to. There's a big famine, everybody's starving to death, and he has food. It would be like if every other place in America right now was out of lumber, and we still had it here in Tinsel Parish. It's about there. Oh. It's a big deal. and They show up to Joseph and that's where... They don't know it's him and that's where we come to, uh, to this. He reveals himself to his brothers. Genesis chapter 50, 
starting verse 15. When Joseph's brothers saw that their father was dead, they said, It may be that Joseph will hate us and pay us back for the evil that we did to him. So they sent a message to Joseph saying, Your father gave this command before he died. Say to Joseph, Please forgive the transgression of your brothers and their sin because they did evil to you. And now please forgive the transgressions of the servants of the God your father. Jesus, uh, Joseph wept when they spoke to him, and his brothers also came and fell down before him and said, Behold, we are your servants. But Joseph said to them, Do not fear, for I am in the place of God. As, you, as for you, you meant evil against me, but God meant it for good, to bring it about that many people would be kept alive. And they are today. So do not fear. I will provide for you and your little ones. Thus he, he comforted them and spoke kindly to them. Anybody here have a hard time forgiving a sibling? Trust me, Joseph had it worse. Anybody have somebody in your life right now you're having a hard time forgiving? Trust me, Joseph had it worse. You're a sinner that has found favor with God, that has been chosen by God, paid for by God, set aside and blessed by God, forgiven by God. And then it said in that last verse that it even gave you and set you to the job of reconciliation. This isn't just the story of the great names of the Old Testament. This is my story. This is your story. And it's your call to go out and forgive. It's your story to forgive. It's your story to teach others too. It's your story to love. It's your story to comfort, to do the work of Christ as the body of Christ until the return of Christ through the power of Christ. It's more than just a story of some cool names. It's your story. What? Are you adding to the story? Let's pray. Oh, Father God, Lord, we thank you. Lord, so many times in life we do have ups and we have downs and we have struggles and we have... Lord, times we just want to quit. And yet you call us out to, to grow through it. Not just to live in spite of it, to grow through it. That's our story. And Lord, you have saved us for it. We ask that you give us, Lord, the strength to do what you've asked us to do. And we thank you for being all the power to get it done. We ask this in the name of Jesus. Amen. Please stand and respond to the Word of God this morning. Precious Jesus, I am ready to surrender every care. Take
we do need to meet him there every day. And I need to meet you, but for fish this evening, please come and enjoy. Uh, let's go out and shine our light so bright that the people around us see Jesus. Amen.